Welcome back, everyone. We're live. I'm sitting down today with Jeremy Newsom. How's it going, Jeremy? Going Welcome great. Back. It's been a while. Glad to be yeah, back. Definitely. People love you here. People love your stuff, love your <laughs> lesson, your content. So you're back here to talk about something pretty interesting, which is kind of two parts. How to improve your trading skills over time. And then the other part I want to talk about today is how to adapt to the market. Because people might have seen a shift in, especially the S&P recently. Yeah. So how do you adapt to that? How do you adapt to new changes? But first, introduce yourself to people, what you do, who you are, and a bit of background about yourself. Absolutely, man. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. My name is Jeremy Alexander Newsom, and I started a company four years ago called Real Life Trading. Our mission is to enrich lives, and we do that by teaching people from all over the world how to properly and safely trade the stock market. I have been dabbling in futures recently, but I still have never placed a Forex trade. Uh, I'm mostly a stocks and options, cryptos, whatever, but you know, stocks and options and futures uh, more recently. And yep, my goal is just to teach people in a fun, energetic, exciting way about how the markets work, how to, be, you know, how to behave in the markets, how to mitigate risk, and do so in a pretty energetic and fun approach. All right, cool. One thing I'm sure about is the fact that no matter what market you trade and thing you you look at in the market. There's always this kind of, like, kind of underlying philosophy or way to see things or the mindset is always the same from what I've seen. So I think even if people were to trade Forex versus stocks or futures, they still have the same things to apply, the same lessons. I kind of want to ask you first, this is going to be on the spot, but do you, have you seen like kind of a few skills or maybe abilities people have that are great traders that others don't? That kind of make them great in all types of conditions of market. Yeah. I, dude, I love you putting me on the spot anytime, <laughs> anytime. You know, I, I've thought very closely and, uh, and deeply about making either an article or a video called the seven best profiles for trading or something like that. And I can share with you what I have found. Uh, the, as far as profiles go, the best trader in the world is usually a female teacher of some kind. Um, and that's because they have incredible time management skills. They're very good with understanding um, risk. So they, they'll, they'll be okay with taking risks. They're like, they're not terrified of taking risks, but they're comfortable with knowing exactly a certain amount. They don't really have a huge ego that gets in their way. You know, they don't throw tons and tons of money on the trade, just hoping it does whatever it does. And they're very, very good at multitasking and they're really good at documenting trades understanding a process, understanding a plan. And the worst traders in the world just usually fall into three categories or either like a business owner, um, engineer, or like a lawyer, doctor, like a very high professional. And a lot of these gentlemen, uh, it boils down to the guys, very often try to have an exact methodology that never changes. And they always approach the market, like if you're an engineer, in, in most engineer roles, you can't be wrong, right? So if you're building something, if it's a rocket ship or if it's uh, you know a, a pipeline, a chemical something, you can't really be wrong because lives will be lost. And that's a phenomenal job to have, right? It's an incredible skill to have in that role. But in the market, when you always have something changing, there's never an exactness. There's very rarely, this is how it is all the time. And the only way you ever get that is if you're dealing with math. So, I mean, if you're dealing with, if you buy a hundred shares that cost you $10, you're always going to know how much you're spending. You know, same thing with Forex. Uh, or, you know, if you're buying certain lots or futures. So there's, unless it's a math based approach, you, you never have an exactness in the market. It's always like, yeah, maybe. And that can really frustrate a lot of, uh, a lot of engineers or, or lawyers or doctors or business owners. People that have a very, very specific, like they need an exact outcome every time. And it just doesn't really happen that way. So I guess in a roundabout way, that's kind of a way to answer your question. But more specifically, people who love change and love risk are going to be people who need to be in the markets. If you love, if you have a high degree of risk, like you're comfortable taking risk, and if you really like change, you embrace change, you embrace variety, then the markets are a place that you could thrive. That's awesome. And I guess then the point is going to be, like anyone can be the market, but it's going to be how do you go from where you are now to being to that next level of like you, you're able to take risk and able to, to change and adapt. 
So yeah. Have you seen like ways that let's say engineers or business owner can go from where they are without changing jobs to becoming good traders? Yeah, totally. And it just it's just a little bit of a mindset shift. I mean, it really does come down to understanding your skill sets, understanding what you're good at. The other reason that a lot of business owners will struggle in the market is because they come, and I'm speaking from firsthand experience here, they come from a perspective of, okay, if there's something wrong, I can put more money in it and make it better. <laughs> right? So if a business owner, if a business is failing like Tesla or Amazon or whatever, you just get more capital injection, the business is okay. It doesn't work that, it doesn't work that way in a trade. There is nothing you can do if a trade's going wrong just because you put more money in it does not mean it's going to work in your favor. And that's one of uh, Paul Tudor Jones, I think this is like number one principle, right? Never add to a losing position. So one of the things that anyone in a position to, is going to have to do is number one, do something different. And what I mean by that is start doing things differently. So if you are, let's just say an engineer and you've never in your entire life been camping by yourself for an entire weekend. Okay, go do that, right? You're gonna have to go do something that you've never done before to kind of break apart the pieces in your brain, to shake things up so you can start seeing different perspectives and different outlines of the way and the trajectory that you gotta go. So that's gonna be really, really key is number one, do things that you've never done before. Number two, put yourself in positions that you've never been in before, which is very similar. And, uh, and number three, you really want to learn different styles in the market. And that way you can have different tools in your basket because at the end of the day, you will need to have certain strategies. So for example, if you're, only, if you're a day trader and that's all you do is just day trade, that's fine. But you'll need to know how to go bullish or how to go bearish, right? You'll need those two, two, those two tool sets. You'll need to have that because if the market does go bearish and you're only looking for bullish trades, it's sometimes going to be a little bit more of a challenge unless, of course, you're doing like an inverse ETF or something. But even then, you need to know that that exists. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. And by the way, you guys can comment in the chat anytime. We'll be able to see your question throughout the, the live today. And there's a question that I want to ask you right away because that's a really good one for now. So Philip asks, do you think that some methodologies are, or system are timeless, meaning they work like anytime, forever? It's a beautiful question, and that's going to be a huge one. So, Philip, yeah, he's saying, don't don't you think some methodologies are timeless? And if it's going to come down to risk, the answer is yes. If you focus on if you focus on risk, the overall perspective of the market always goes up over time is one that I do agree with. Um, in essence, the economies are supposed to grow, even if we have a recession or a depression. There are absolutely factors of you saying if xyz adds up to this and this is profitable and these companies are making money and they're producing value in the world they will go up over time to some degree to some level especially if they're already in a bullish trend take amazon or take apple for example you know uh, microsoft is a really good one johnson and johnson walmart procter and gamble pfizer so you you have certain companies that if they add value to the world um, they they will go up over time, but you have to have a risk principle as far as what it is that you're risking because there will be a time where it won't go up. And so if you're only playing a position bullish and all you're doing is looking for bullish positions, there will be a time where it doesn't go up and you have to take that loss, soak it in, and then understand when the next good time to buy is. Yeah, so what do you think is that's good loot for like five years? Because it's on the right time, but then you, you would still do the same thing and that would be wrong, right? Correct. Okay, that makes sense. Awesome. So I want to talk first about kind of what it takes to become a better trader, in your opinion. What are the are the like, some steps people should take to go from wherever they are now? Because it doesn't matter where you start, in my opinion. It matters where you're heading and what you do to, to get there. So what should, like, what should people do when they start and they want to be, get better at trading? What would be like, a few steps? Good, dude. Such a good question. So, if you want to get better at trading, one of uh, one of the people that I've worked with, you know, a mentor of mine in the past, said you have to get screen time. So, if you're going to trade, you got to put yourself in front of that screen and do it a lot. Because if you're going to get better at anything, you're going to be a chef, a baker. If you're going to be a professional athlete, if you're going to be a bodybuilder, you're going to have to put in time. 
a lot of time. And the best way to do that is some, some version of historical replay or back trading. So go back in time on a particular stock, Forex, currency pair, futures, whatever, and trade it as it's going day by day or hour by hour or minute by minute. But going back in time and getting years of experience in hours worth of time. So being able to trade the 2008 crash is totally doable um, on many charting softwares, right? You can go back in time and go day by day or week by week and get that screen time in because you can only get 20, I mean, what? You're gonna spend 12 hours a day in front of the screen, that's fine, you can do that. But if you're gonna spend 12 hours every single day, the markets are not gonna be open that entire time unless you're trading again Forex or something that's will trade a lot more, but even some of those are gonna close. So at some point you've gotta get that screen time in to be able to figure out what patterns you're looking for, what candle patterns you're looking for, where you're gonna get in, where you're gonna get out. So the second part, the second answer to your question is when you're going back in time and you're practicing these trades over and over and over, is you're trying to write down what are you thinking, why are you thinking that, where are you getting in, where are you getting out, and why? You have to understand the why behind what it is that you're doing. It doesn't sound like it makes much sense, but if you're trying to think of why am I buying here and you can't come up with an answer, probably shouldn't be buying there, right? If you can look at the pattern and the charts and you're trying to say why is someone doing something? What are they thinking? Why are they buying here? Why are they getting out here? And if you can extrapolate that data from the chart, it's going to make you an exceptionally better trader because all people care about at the end of the day is price. That's all they care about, man. When it comes to the when it comes to the market, are they making money or are they losing money? If you have someone that has a hundred million dollars investment into Johnson and Johnson, and that stock tanks ten percent in a day, they don't care what uh, the the MACD is doing or an indicator or whatever. They're going to do their absolute best to hedge that position to lose as small as they can. So. And, and then people are going to be selling and, and locking in profits and selling to get out for a loss and things of that nature. So yeah, that's going to be one of the best ways to get that experience and to really practice to hone that skills is getting uh, back trading the markets, going back in time and practicing what occurred so that you can see these patterns and you can replicate them into the future. Yeah, I did that for a super long time. Like every, I was thinking back then, but every evening I would go back like two hours in my chart. Doing that over and over again for like a couple of weeks, even a couple of months. I know you went more all in than, than I did by doing it like all the time, all day, every day. Yeah. But that that's a pretty crazy story. So, but that's really a good thing to apply. Now, how long should people do this, and when should they stop back testing? Is there like a, a time point where they should get kind of shift something else, that's or should they do it like as much as they can? Yeah, that's a really good question. Should you, should you ever stop? I I think my answer is no. Yeah. For example, if you if you were Tom Brady or Odell Beckham, I'm using some football football examples, but you know who they are. Um, <laughs> if you're if you're Tom Brady or Odell Beckham, you're you're practicing. You're continually getting better at your skills, right? Um, there's a old commercial. I forget what the commercial was, but they're interviewing Emmitt Smith, who was one of my who's my favorite running back of all time. Also, as a Gator graduate, go Gators, and he. Uh, was being interviewed in his commercial. I forget if it was a Coke commercial, or whatever, but they said, Hey, Emmett Smith, you just won the Super Bowl. What are you going to do now? And he goes, I'm going to rest. And he was on this bench press machine. He was benching like 400 pounds. And so he hit it and he was doing it like he was doing a bench press. And then when he had the weight up in the air, he looks at the camera and goes, All right, that's two seconds of rest. And then he started working out again. I was like, Man, that's so epic. So he just won a Super Bowl, and they're just asking him, what are you going to do now? And he's keep, he's keep grinding. He's continually building that craft. The, the problem with success for so many people is a lot of people think it's a destination. They think it's somewhere that I'm going to make this amount of money, and then I'm done. I no longer have to work at it. I no longer have to try. I no longer have to continue to improve. And that's garbage. Because if you make that money, number one, you're going to want more. Number two, you're probably going to deserve more. Number three, you're going to give a lot of it away, mostly to charities or your friends or your families or help other people somewhere in the world. So you're going to need more money in order to do that. But number four, you're not going to just want to let that money evaporate because you work so hard to get it. So you're going to want to continue increasing your skills. So if we can understand in our brains that success is not something that's just that's going to happen, it's not like an, an end goal, then if we can realize that we're much more 
inclined to continually doing those small stepping stones of progress to continue going forward and, and achieve those results that you're looking for. It's awesome. It's awesome. All about the continuous process. So, and I totally agree. I totally, I totally agree with you on that, and the fact that you should do it like all the time to improve and to keep becoming better. I think that's a good skill that most people want. Like they do it for some time, then they get a profitable strategy, but they stop. And you probably know, like me, that it's really important as you trade and you become better to focus on like other strategies, other ways you can make money, other opportunities in the market. Yeah. Have you ever felt like, or or have you found a way in your career where you went from one strategy to to another or you added something more to your portfolio of trading did it happen for you it definitely did um and it was kind of to my detriment because what happens when you first start trading is you try to learn everything because you're so excited and you become the map you know you become the uh the master of nothing so the the jeremy of all trades master of nothing so you have 400 things that you're okay at and at some point, the most frustrating thing is in, in, in the trading career and in trading success is to have the ability to know the one thing that you are really good at and continually doing that. For example, think about it this way. If you are going, let's say you want to be a professional sports athlete, a professional sports player, you want to play soccer um, or American football or basketball. You're going to get really good at this one particular sport and most likely one particular position within that particular sport. And you're going to master that position. For example, going back to Tom Brady, all he does is throw the ball physically, walks around a little bit, runs every now and then, scouts the defense, but he knows his specific goal and what he's trying to accomplish. So for me, when I was um, adding to the portfolios of things that I do, my biggest suggestion would be once you can make money consistently for at least four to five months with a particular strategy, then you can go learn another strategy. The hardest part is many people's account sizes might be too small to have numerous strategies. So for example, if you're swing trading, day trading, you're doing credit spreads, if you're doing option trading, um, that can easily, very quickly soak up an account. So you're either keeping your risk smaller or the amount of strategies that you're doing, um, you're keeping those smaller because at some particular point, you're gonna run out of money way before you run out of opportunities. And the strategies are often the least important thing in trading. My opinion is you have to determine the direction and the timing. If you don't know those two things, it doesn't matter what strategy you do, you'll probably end up losing money at some point. So understanding the timing and the trends, those are masterfully important for what you do next. Because again, if you don't get the right strategy, whatever strategy you use, if it's the wrong time, you'll lose money. All right. So I want to get into those a little bit more. So direction and timing is football. Like what would that mean exactly? And that's kind of a whole training process, but how would they go through those two parts when they look at a chart? Woo, yes. Okay. One of the biggest things I can encourage anyone here to really dive into is Dow theory. Yes, Charles Dow, like the guy from the Dow Jones Industrial Average. He's kind of a big deal. Um, I should have, <laughs> actually, I have a shirt that says I'm a Taoist and it has a picture of him on there. Um, <laughs> Charles Dow is the grandfather of modern day technical analysis. So if you're doing anything with charting, you got to think the Dow. Him, you got to think Mr. Dow. And Dow theory is an incredible approach to any market. Doesn't matter if you're trading forex, futures, commodities, or stocks and options. Dow theory is so crucial because it's going to really, really help you with your timing. So, for example, right now on the S and P, this Standard and Poor's 500, I can tell you for sure, without question, we are in a distribution phase. And there's only two things that occur in a distribution phase. They either continue, which means we're going to chop around and trade sideways for a while, or they break down and go lower into a bearish public participation phase, which will eventually end in a accumulation pattern. And again, that accumulation pattern is either going to break down lower or it breaks down higher. There's no other way it works. So if you know for sure that we're in a distribution phase because you're able to look at the market and go, okay, we're in a very nice public participation phase. Now we're going to rest and calm down and kind of chill out for a little bit. Being able to determine that 
on a bigger a bigger scale is massively integral in your trading. So I usually suggest everyone to start out on a weekly chart and get an idea of where are we in the phase of the market? Are we in a distribution, public participation, or accumulation? And knowing what those three things mean. From there, you're able to zoom into a daily time frame. And once you're in a daily time frame, you're able to take advantage of the moves. And then it comes down to what are your goals as a trader? What are your objectives? Are you trying to make money every month? Are you trying to make money every day? Are you trying to make money you know, every quarter or over the year and kind of like longer term? Well, for a lot of people, they're retired. And if you want to, let's say you want to play golf all day and you just want to relax, enjoy the fruits of your labor, you have a, you know, you have a nest egg and you just want to grow that safely. That's entirely different than someone like me and you, right, man? Because me and you, we're young, we're vibrant, we have 70 years ahead of us before you even think about retirement. And we want to grow things somewhat aggressively um, to an extent. So we're going to be doing maybe smaller types of trades. So it will come down to, uh, for, for sure, it will come down to what someone's goals and objectives and their time frame. Because once you're at the daily chart, you're either zooming in to like a 15 minute, five minute or three minute or potentially an hourly, two hourly and you're hanging out around the daily charts and those are your, kind of your main time frames. But even then, you're able to, um, to zoom in and figure out your, uh, your distribution, accumulation, public participation type of phases. All right. So one question I get a lot about the topic of like multiple time frame is how do you get confused with all the time frame? How do you not like mix the weekly, daily, and forward chart and do all the same thing? Like, is there a process you follow like this and that time frame, this and this time frame, or it's just like mix and blend everything? Good question. Let me try it. Uh, let me share. Let me share my screen. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. And uh, I, someone from the YouTube live, if YouTube live, someone wants to throw out a stock for me. I'll hop over to YouTube Live, so you probably should be able to see the YouTube Live stream. But someone who here is on YouTube Live want to throw out any kind of company, I can pull up that company. I'll show you just kind of what my eyes are looking for as quickly as I can. Uh, and if you have one too, Ntn, I can I can check out that as well. Yeah, I'm not sure. We'll, we'll, we'll probably let people choose, but there's a small delay, so gotcha. you can choose. Okay, so yeah. Philips is Apple. Or Apple, yeah. Let's go with Apple. It should yeah, be a good start. Apple's perfect. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull up mm -hmm. Apple. And like I mentioned, the very, very beginning, I'm going to pull up the weekly time frame. What I'm going to do is just kind of hide all the drawings for a moment so we can clearly see the trend. So what I'm looking for is I pull up the weekly chart and I go, all right, what are we doing? And immediately what I'm seeing is this bullish trend that had a really nice dip right here. This was 2012, 2013, followed by another nice bullish trend that had a nice little dip followed by a nice little bullish trend, and right now we are having a dip. So my brain, you're trying to figure out, like I mentioned earlier, if you're practicing the trading, you're gonna find out why are you doing whatever it is that you're doing. So if I'm looking at Apple and I'm saying to myself, okay, I'm probably gonna be looking to buy at some point. The question is where, where do you start buying? And what you'd wanna do is go back in, his, go back in time, use the stock chart, or use the Forex or the currency pair, use the chart to your advantage to go back in time and see what it has done in the past and see if you can get any example of what it will do based on that information. So on Apple, for example, if I, if I, uh, I can find out how much the stock pulled back in 2013, it was approximately 40%. Pretty big retracement, but it was approximately 40% back in 2013. It's like, okay, let me go do that exact same thing. Let me find out approximately how big we pulled back in 2015, which is about 30%. So if I go to Apple now and I go, all right, where are we located at this present moment in time? And right now we're down about 27%. So the last move we had was down about 30 and the one before that was around 45. So right now we're at 27, which tells me that based on the last two previous retracements on Apple, we're probably going to go a little bit farther. So now that I have that, I'm gonna look at this and I'm gonna go, okay, based on that, what phase of the market do I think we're in? Well, if, if I know the phase of the market and I can say that this is uh, pretty much without question a public participation phase, and this is obviously a distribution phase, and that this is a bearish public participation phase, 
My goal is to try to find out where the stock will stop moving. So in order to do that, I'm gonna zoom into a daily chart. And once I have a daily chart, um, let me do this, move it over here. You'll actually see I do have some targets um, down here. And those two targets are really based on these previous levels where we've bounced before in the past. So if I'm zooming into another time frame, my goal is if I am a longer term investor or someone who wants to buy company shares for a longer period of time, I'm going to be spending a lot of time on the daily and the weekly. If I am an actively aggressive trader and I really want to play these moves much more quick, I'm going to zoom into an hourly chart. And if I know on an hourly chart that right now we're in a bearish trend and we're in a bearish trend on the daily chart and on the weekly chart, we might be bouncing at some point in time. I could be looking for bearish trades on the hourly and at some juncture on a daily time frame and a weekly time frame, when we trade down to an area which I feel comfortable buying there, then I can zoom in again to an hourly chart and start picking apart the bottom. So as far as multiple time frames, what really ends up happening is you just have to understand that there are numerous different types of time frames out there that you can choose from. All right, I'll stop, I'll stop my screen sharing now. So there's numerous different time frames that you can choose from. You have to realize that they're all going to be right at some point in time. The question is, will you be there to take advantage of it? So for example, if you only trade the hourly chart, and that's all you do. You don't look at the weekly chart, you don't look at the daily chart, you don't look at anything other than the hourly. You will make money. But you might miss a reversal that happened on the daily chart. You might miss a reversal that happens on the weekly chart. You might miss some type of moving average. But that's okay. Because the fact is, you're going to miss trades anyway, guaranteed. So you have to pick multiple time frames that make sense to your time frame and your trading objective. And based on that, really dial down to what it is you're trying to focus on. So, so what I understand, and, and this is the biggest thing, thing is the fact bad. that you don't chase the time frame, but you you pick the time frame and you wait for price to shoot set up on that time frame without chasing them, basically. Correct. Yep, exactly. I mean, you, you just the thing is, you just pick the time frame. And here's the part that, that confuses and upsets a lot of traders is you have you have to pick and yeah. then you have to stick. <laughs> a little bit of a quote for it. You have to pick and you have to stick. The, I mean, the thing is, imagine if Tom Brady, you know, uh, every year wanted to, ch to play on a different football team. I mean, he could, right? He could go to any team that he wanted to, but if you keep popping back and forth to different teams, you're not going to get the flow. You're not going to understand the, the, uh, the plays. You're not going to understand the coaches. You're not going to understand the players' talents. At some point, in order to achieve success in anything, you've got to pick and stick. Just say, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give it X amount of time. And then once you go through X period of time of that time frame and or strategy, you'll then know, did it work or did it not work? You actually have data. You can say, yep, I stuck to that really well. I didn't change. I focused just on this and it ended up working out in my favor. That's really well said. Super massive value right there. I love it. That's awesome. Thanks. Well, there was a question from uh, Philip earlier, which I kind of lost, but I'm going to try to go back. Yeah, I was looking and at that one too. I think that was about uh, any thoughts on the, on the importance of being sharp for the training week. Do you limit alcohol consumption on a weekend, follow a nutrition plan, or sleep? What exactly do you do? All right. So this is my exact routine because, Philip, that's a really, really good question. Um, my trading plan has a rule specifically that says I cannot trade under the influence of anything. So I don't drink caffeine because it's a stimulant. Uh, I don't drink coffee. I know that sounds, that sounds crazy, but I, I, I've never – I just don't drink coffee. I think people rely on it as a crutch. Like, oh, I have to have my coffee in order to stay awake. It's like, no, dude. What did they do thousands of years ago when they didn't have coffee or whatever? It's like you don't have – you are going to do whatever your mind says you're going to do. So if you say you need coffee, then you'll need coffee. But you don't. It's not something that's required in your body to live. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't drink coffee. Um, I don't trade on the influence of anything. So if I, if I have a, an injury or something and I'm on uh, some type of painkiller, which has, hasn't happened ever, but 
Uh, Adderall, I won't take Adderall. A lot of people make jokes about you know, trading and taking Adderall. So I don't, I don't trade under the influence of anything. Um, now, the, the funny part is that that includes the night. So let's say I go out and I have some drinks with some buddies uh, over during the week, which certainly will happen. Um, then I can't come home and like go in and adjust any trades or any stops or anything like that. Right. I can't, I can't trade on the influence of anything. Um, so that's one of the rules as far as sleep. I mean, yeah, I try to get a, a good amount of sleep every night. The, what, one of the best things that I could encourage anyone to do is when you go, get, go to sleep when you get tired and then wake up when your body wakes up. Most people um, will wake up to go use the bathroom like around four to five in the morning and then they'll go back to sleep. Dude, just stay awake. If your body woke you up to go to the bathroom, just stay awake and then do that all day until you get tired again. And then you'll get tired around like whatever, whatever time it is, 10, 10, 30, 11, go to sleep and just wake up when your body wakes up. Obviously you can have an alarm in case you sleep in too late, but once your body wakes up, just be up for the rest of the day. That's what I do. And that's a super, super useful um, advent as far as time, invest in a good mattress, spend some money on the bed so that you do get a good sleep. Uh, I mean, health, health is wealth and you, you got to you got to take care of your body. One of the other things that I do, this is um, not trying to brag or anything. There's something called like a five minute journal. I had one of my traders. Her name is Kristen Kidgel. She sent me this journal for Christmas and um, I try to write in that every day. And every day, this is a true story, and people are going to laugh at this. Every day that I don't write in that book, I, I have lost money every day that I didn't do it. And every day that I have written in that book, I've made money. So people are probably like, why don't you just write in it every single day? It's like, dude, sometimes you forget or you're tired or you know, your, your head hurts or whatever. But you know, sometimes you just pass your brain. So I'm really making it a habit it's called the five-minute journal. You spend five minutes right when you wake up and you write, what are three things, you know, what are three things I'm grateful for? So you're writing either people's names or things that you're, that you feel grateful for. And you try to live in that first few hours of the morning with a little bit of a, with a gratefulness attitude, like in your heart. And then the other thing is what are three things I want to accomplish today? And then the next things are, what are your, what are two affirmations for today? What are two things? And so today I wrote, I am bold and I am excited and excited. And so those are the two things I wrote today. And I, I made money today, you know, day trading. So that's one of the, that, that's one of the things I do right when I wake up. Um, as far as nutrition, here is one of the coolest dietary plans I've ever heard of. Dude, you're going to love this one. <laughs> this, is, this is fun. I forget the doctor that was, was mentioning this. It was like a TED Talk or TEDx Talk. But he said, you can eat anything that you want as long as you cook it. Think about that, man. How many times will we go out and eat garbage? Uh, like if it's a, like a brownie or cake or beer or sugar, 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 whatever it is, we go out, we buy it. But if you make it at home, dude, eat as much as you want because it's the amount of time that you're going to actually cook those desserts or cook those. It's going to take time and you're not going to make as many as you think you would for most people. And when I say make it, I mean from scratch. I don't mean like buy the, you know, like the cookies and cut them up and put them in the tent. Like that's, no, no, no. I'm talking about like making the cookie. So I actually, over the last three or four months, I've been living by that principle, man. And it's been going pretty well. Like I've definitely eaten out. I'm not a saint, okay? I've eaten out, I've had drinks, but when it comes to like just my normal meal, whatever I eat, it's, it's made from scratch. Even if it's noodles or... Um, I'm trying to think what I had for breakfast today. So I had like turkey meatballs and asparagus. So I didn't grow the asparagus, but it was, you know, asparagus and turkey meatballs. Didn't grow the turkey. But you know what I'm saying? Like you make it. Like you, you, yeah. I'm the one doing the ham, you know, the meatballs and putting it in the thing. So that, that as far as nutrition goes, has been a really useful advent as of recent days. Pretty interesting. Pretty impressed with that. And I think that's really good advice too. I'm going to try some, uh, some of these things for sure. Yeah, thanks. Love it. That's good. Awesome. Uh, Lucky says, funny thing, I have the same thing, but for me, it's training rule. I mostly lose if I forget to, or read my training plan every morning. Yeah, exactly. So similar to what you were doing, I think, with the uh, five minute journal, which I highly recommend too, I'm using that also. Uh, he says, if it does not review its plan in the beginning of the day, 
it's probably gonna lose money that day. And I'm curious, do you do the same thing? Do you like review your plan every day or is it something you kind of built now where you don't have to review all the time your plan? Dude, so I wish I had one right now. I could probably go get one if you want me to, but um, I have I have six of them. They're laminated and I got them right by my trading desk and I do review them every single day. Uh, because you think you'll know what your plans are and then you go to trade something and I'll go pull up my plan and I go, wait, can I do this? You know, I'll read over and go, oh shoot, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I get reminded frequently of things I can't do because my brain, you get tractor beamed in the market. The, the market's goal is to confuse most people most of the time. So you're going to get tractor beamed to going, oh man, I want to take this trade. And so you just take it and you don't even think about like, is it, what type of movement is it? What does it fit what you did? Are you allowed to do it? All that kind of good stuff. So yes, I do have my plans laminated. They're, they look nice. I paid money to have like a person make them look really pretty graphic designs like in the background of every plan is a bunch of pictures of traders and people I've met and people that I like and people I aspire to be because so I have pictures of those in the background places I want to go and uh, yeah they're just they're kind of like gradiently placed behind my the words of my trading plan and I got six so I have credit spreads um, put sales swing trading day trading long-term investing uh, and I'm working on uh, futures and I have crypto Nice. That's that's how, that's a really good way to do it. That's awesome. Oh. And the other thing I heard from someone else is that that person will also like review his best trade of the day. Like just before starting to do this, reviewing the best trades in the journal every day to kind of keep track of like the best trades and stuff. So I think that, that that's a good idea too. Oh but, man, uh, really like you're worth doing it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Like I I tell people all the time, go back and, and go back and trade what you took earlier today and see if you would have done that. And here's the thing, man. Just try to find one super small thing that you can tweak for the next day. So for me, if I go and trade something and I go, man, you know what? I entered that way too low. Like I was trying to get in and like it broke out and I got in and it popped and then rolled over. I got in too low. I could have gotten in higher. So let's say I'm trying to go short, right? I'm trying to make money on the downside. If I do that, I'll go back and review that trade. And I'll say, okay, so for tomorrow, I'm going to try to get in at a little bit of a higher price. So just, just tomorrow, that's going to be my goal. My main focus is that if I short something, I'm just going to try to get in it at a little bit of a higher price. And then let's say I do that, I do that trade, and then you know what? I move my stop too aggressively and end up not making that much money. Then the next day I'll go, okay, so I move my stop too aggressively on that trade. The next trade, which will be tomorrow, let me move my stop a little bit less aggressive. And you know, you just try to find that one thing from one of the previous trades that you took that uh, they can you know, make that adjustment. So yeah, I, I totally agree. I think reviewing your trades is massively important. Awesome, wonderful. I think we touched on that in the past. And if you have any questions, just comment below in the chat. We'll have a few here. But I wanna go through that. So we touched on that already a little bit in the past where it's like about how to adapt to the market. You talk about the market phase, kind of how to identify that and sit in the market. Is there anything you see that people have to change over time and any ways they have to adapt other than like the market phase, things that happen in the market? I'm guessing like maybe volatility or other factors that you have to consider when you trade. Dude, without question. I mean, one of the biggest things that we're experiencing right now is, you know, we're experiencing in the, in the stock market, the most bearish, S&P 500 since the Great Depression in, in the month of December. So this is the most bearish December of all time since 19, you know, since the 1920s, late 1920s, 30s. That's, that's a big deal. So I mean, what are we doing? How do you adjust for that? And my overall answer is you do have to have other skill sets and other strategies that you use and you want to be able to, um, you want to be able to implement those. So for example, if you have an IRA or a 401k and you have your stocks in, in, these, um, in these positions and you're losing money, there's not much you can do other than, because you can't, I mean, it's hard depending on your positions and what you're doing in your experience level, it's hard to just go out and protect yourself, but you've got to learn and it's the information's out there. So that's the answer to your question, man. If, if the market's changing, go out and learn how to hedge and that's all you need to look, just start typing in how to hedge my portfolio, how to hedge a long position, how to hedge in a 401k, 
term hedge, right? Hedge fund. That's all it is. Hedge fund, when the market goes down, most of them lose money, but they don't lose a lot, right? They usually lose like two, 3% for that year, whatever it is. It's not, it's not an astronomical amount of money, but they don't lose like what your 401k is going to lose or your IRA, which is probably, you know, 20, 30%. So they lose a lot smaller and that's because they're hedging. They're buying puts, uh, they're buying inverse ETFs. They're having um, positions that go up when the market goes down. And that's the only advice that I could even think about giving is you have you have to understand and learn what instruments can you use to make money in the down market. And even if you have a long term portfolio, we're like, I'm not going to touch this. I'm going to weather the storm. Buy low, sell high, baby. Hey, that's totally fine. But on this spectrum over here, let's say this is your big account and you have a smaller account over here. You can use this account to day trade or to, you know, to use options or to do something different. But yeah, bottom line, man, the answer is just education. You have to teach yourself because there are numerous ways out there to protect yourself. That's why I love the stock market because you have options literally and figuratively. You have things that you can do to protect yourself on the downside. I don't know if that, if that exists in currencies or not. I'm sure it probably does, but I don't know. Um, but anyway, yeah, man, you just have to learn. You have to educate and just understand and be okay with the realization that there's a lot of ways to protect yourself in, 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 in a market that shifts and changes. Mm -hmm. Is the possibility for you of kind of stepping aside and not trading for some time, is, like, is, is that valid or no? Will you stop trading for some time because of the context and the condition or never? You'll always, uh, always adapt to kind of what's happening. Ooh, good question. Man, I'd love to say that uh, I, I never have to do that. Yes, there are going to be times you're going to have to walk away. And it's not that you should have to know what the market is going to do because you don't. We'll never know for sure. My thought is always create a best case scenario, worst case scenario, and something in the middle. Create all three scenarios and trade those scenarios because one of the three most likely will happen, right? The market either goes up, down, or sideways. So you're either going to have a best case, worst case, or middle case scenario. And if you can create that on your chart, draw it, have an idea of what it is that you want it to do, and then when it starts doing it, you act on that. And in situations, the only time I would suggest just totally walking away and abandoning the positions or the trades or the market is if you're really new and you're just hemorrhaging money and you have no idea how to stop. Bottom line, if you're losing a lot of money, because you shouldn't ever lose a lot of money. So if you're losing a lot of money, put the brakes on at some point and just go, you know what, I need to learn. Let me figure out what the issue is and just go through books, go through courses, go through webinars, spend a little bit of money educating yourself, whatever the case is, spend some time educating yourself um, but yeah, there's certainly times, man, I've had to step away from the market. Usually it's because I'm losing. So if I, that's one of my rules. If I have a losing streak, which a losing streak for me is defined as six losses in a row or more in a row on every trade. So swing trades, day trades, options, doesn't matter. Everything I'm doing, I'm losing on. If I lose six in a row or more, I'm now in a losing streak, which I was at the very beginning of December. For some reason, man, the first week of December was brutal. And I went down, um, three three point seven five percent in one week and i was just like holy smokes which my loss my max loss for a week is five percent so if i lose five percent in a week like i have to shut it down and i was at three point i was at three point seven five percent loss on a thursday so i still had a friday to go you know like oh man so i took it really small i took it very nimble that friday and then just readjusted myself over the weekend uh, but I didn't quit. I poured more time into it. I poured more time into the charts, going over the patterns, asking myself, what are people thinking? Why are they thinking it? Getting an idea and getting a grasp. But if I am on a losing streak, um, there is a point in time where I do step away from the charts, shut it down, turn my brain off, relax, you know, the off season for athletes, right? That's why athletes have an off season. It's to relax a little bit, to get the brain, to do other things, to enjoy something else, and then come back. So, yeah, my, that, that'd be my advice. If you're losing, you're scared, you're frustrated, you're annoyed, you're upset, you're not in the right state of mind, and you're doing something wrong, which is losing money, uh, that, would be, that would be one of the conditions that would be met to, to walk away. Yeah. 
And I think a really good thing you could do is to go back and see if you did any mistakes in your trades, because that happens. That happens for me in the past a lot. Sure. Well, like I was, I, I thought I was trading well, but then I go back and I made a few mistakes, and just I like, can fold in like more errors and more bad trades, and a drawdown. So that happens. That happened for me in the past. Oh yeah, man. You're gonna you got to find out what's that one mistake that you made. Um, what's the one thing that you did wrong, and uh, and try to overcome that. Um, I'll also answer Marcus's question because it's really easy. He says, how many yeah. trades do you advise per day? Um, you do need to come up with a per day amount in your plan. So someone answered him and said, hey, however much is in your plan? Most people don't have an amount of you know how many trades they're going to take. For me, I'm allowed to take five day trades a day. Uh, I very rarely do. Um, usually somewhere between three and four. I can set up a lot of trades, but I can't take more than five a day. So that's that's one of mine. I usually usually take two, and one of my rules is if I take two trades a day, and the net result of both of those trades is me winning 0.7 percent or less, I'm done for the day. Um, if I take the very first trade of the day and I win very very small, I have to be super cautious about the next trade that I take. Uh, really really you know nice large stop so I can lose really small on it. Um, and there's a few other rules like that, but yeah, for me, very rarely do I, am I taking more than three trades in a day. Interesting. And that's based on how many trades there are in the market or based on the risk parameters you have. Yeah, dude, just risk parameters, man, because there's, there's literally hundred thousand trades you could take in any given day and no one has enough money to do that. Literally yeah. no one. So you can't be in everything. You can't trade everything. Just find the two or three that are that you like. Because the truth is, man, if you can't be profitable trading, if you're if you're a day trader or an aggressive trader, and you can't be profitable taking two or three trades a day, you ain't gonna be profitable taking twenty. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's not gonna it's not gonna get better for you. <laughs> no. Plus, it's also much easier to take fewer trades, but focus on those, and then be done after. Like you don't have to chase anything. Yeah, totally. I feel it's easier this way. Yeah. yeah. So Texmex says, when you're entering a trade, do you enter at the beginning of the session? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I have no problem with that. Usually, what I do for for day trading, and that's mostly my specialty, is day trading. I look for a gap. So I look for something that's gapping up or gapping down, and kind of get an idea of where the support resistances are, uh, who's buying, who's selling, who's losing money, and then set up the trade. But yeah, absolutely, man. The first hour, hour and a half, you know totally prime time for some great day trades and then later in the afternoon as well but yeah of course early in the session um i i went back and looked at my win loss ratio in the first two minutes of the day so from 8 30 central to 9 30 a.m eastern to 9 32 if i enter a trade i have like a 20 percent success ratio so i usually wait two minutes uh, at least and then once i have that two minute trade i'll kind of set up and you know kind of go from there yeah, as part of, of knowing your numbers and your stats, which is uh, pretty big. Yeah. Dude, got to know those numbers for sure. Exactly. I love this. We can answer your question a little bit more after in the chat. I know there's a few more. And you guys, if you have any questions, just comment there and ask your question. You have the chance to ask any question you want to Jeremy, which who is really good at answering any question possible in the world. <laughs> but Jeremy, I'm so excited for you. You're staying in a few weeks in December, a free week to your trading room. Tell people what it's about and what can they expect from this. Uh, yeah, man, I, I appreciate that. Thank, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, at the end of January, so the very last week of January, so let me check my my calendar really quick. So that is uh, January 28th. I'm hosting a free trading room experience. Uh, I do have a trading room, and most trading rooms just aren't great. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people, it's they're not excited. They don't talk about what they're doing. You're just watching other people make money, which, hey, is cool. Not a big, not a big problem in making money. That's great. But if you don't know what they're doing, where they're getting in, or why they're getting in, you can't really follow along. What's the? I'm only going to watch someone make money for so long because I, before I go, I want to do that. So my goal of the trading room of over the last four years is being a slower paced room that focuses more on showing people why they're getting in, where they're getting in, pulling the trigger, having the appropriate risk, and discussing why why are we getting in here why are we getting out there and having people have a really good foundation and understanding for that so that's my goal in the trading room to do that 
Um, there's tons of people that have trading rooms out there and I'm by no means saying I'm the best trader in the world. I don't think I am the best trader in the world. What I do know is I am the best educator in the world for the stock market, hands down. And that's kind of my goal. And I, I like to put myself in that pedestal because I think I can teach anyone who wants to learn this. I think I can teach them how. And there's a lot of pros and cons to learning in a trading room. And I'm fully, I, I totally agree. Some people, it's not their best environment, right? Because there's a lot of people talking and there's a lot of energy and a lot of excitement, a lot of ideas. Sometimes it's a little bit fast paced, but for a lot of people, people learn well in group environments. And if you don't, if you learn better in one-on-one -on -one environments, that's also fine. I mean, you know, me and you both have worked together in the past and we can do one-on-one -on -one stuff as well. And that's just kind of part of it. But most most people have told me that the trading rooms that they've been involved in just kind of suck because they don't know what's going on. And what sets my, my trading room apart from many others is the simple fact that we're very clear about what we're doing. Yeah, it's awesome. And for having been there at your last free trading week, if you, I think it was like a year back, I really love that. I really love the concept and the way you explain things and stuff. So uh, people want to join that, then definitely it's, that's worth it. And the link's going to be below in the description for you guys to sign up. I think they're probably going to get an email. I'm not sure how you do things, but they probably get an email before the week to tell them to sign up. Or how does that work? Yep, absolutely. Uh, so uh, if you have if you have the link, I mean, uh, you can, you're welcome to send out the link uh, to the room. And I'll be emailing everyone pretty much on the entire internet, letting you all know that it's going to be there. So I only do it twice a year, mostly because I'm a bad businessman. Um, my business coach is always like, dude, you need to do it. You know, you need to have a free week every month. I'm like, man, it's too much. I, I, I want to trade. So it's not about sales. It's, it's about teaching people and helping people. Um, but yeah, they can sign up. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you'll post the link in the description box and they can click on those links. So feel free to check that out and uh, be really excited to trade with everyone. Fantastic. Awesome. And from there, we have a bunch of questions in the chat that I think you'll find interesting. Maybe go with uh, Shazad. That's going to work for, this is like books in general. So what are some books some books to read for beginners to, he says Forex, but let's just say trading in general, in your opinion. Good books for the beginning trader. I think, uh, I believe it's Stock Market Wizards by Jack Schwager. Yeah. Solid. Um, Money Master the Game by Tony Robbins is very good. It's a thick book, but I highly recommend it. It's very eye-opening. Um, other ones for really good beginners. I mean, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator is interesting. It's not necessarily like a must-read. Trading in the Zone is obviously very good by Mark Douglas. And um, anything that Warren Buffett has ever put his hands on is a must. Uh, you know, The Intelligent Investor is a little dry, but it's really good. Analysis of stock trends. I'm looking around to see if I have that over there to figure out who that's by. I don't remember who wrote analysis of stock trends, but that one's really good. That kind of talks about uh, just how to how to read different charts, again, Dow theory and things of that nature. So those would be kind of a, a quick glossing over. Perfect. Awesome. Good books. And uh, I think I'll, I'll have a list of books on my website. But yeah, th those are good ones for sure. Um, I, I like Lewis's question. This is fun, man. So Lewis, Go ahead. Lewis says ninety percent of traders lose and quit. Dude, ninety percent of people quit at everything. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Dude, it ain't just trading, man. You're talking. Let's no. let's say you want to go out and create a company. It doesn't yeah. matter what company you're creating. You could be doing door-to-door -door book sales. You could be selling knives. You could you could be doing a casino. You could do a restaurant. 90% of people will lose. I mean, it's even higher than 90%. So 99.999% of people fail to be a professional athlete. 99.999% of people fail to be a professional musician that gets paid $100,000 or more a year. Right? I live here in Nashville, and I have swaths of friends who, um, who are in the music industry who get paid less than $30,000 a year to do music, if that. Right, ninety nine point nine nine percent of voiceover actors, you know, fail. Nine nine point nine 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 percent of uh, of actors never make it to Hollywood and get paid millions of dollars. So, man, ninety eight percent of people fail at everything. So uh, that's to me, yeah, just work harder and grind and learn and read and have better mentors and and just do your best 
to get past the point of just not quitting because everyone in their life and every single profession ever has come into that wall and that hurdle and that barrier where they go, man, this really sucks. This is hard. This is frustrating. I hate it. And they just, they want to give up. That's happened to me 47 times, you know, in the last six years. And I sit back and I think about it and I go, okay, why am I having a bad day? What's stressful about this? What's, what's reality? You know, I was talking to, uh, to my fiance about that recently. Like, what, what, what's reality? The things in my head, the things I'm thinking, I'm probably over-exaggerating. They're not actually real. You know, my, your worst nightmares probably aren't going to come true. So just take a deep breath, relax, and just figure out what's, what's actually happening and move on. Yeah. But would you agree that you kind of shift to being more confident about your goals when you surround yourself with the right people, people doing what you want to do in life? Yep. Absolutely, man. I mean, the thing is, if, if you have a goal to be a full time trader, get around other full time yeah. traders. Just that simple. Like, be, this be is massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If that's what you want to do, man, if you, most people love the markets. And if you love the markets, be around people who love the markets and trade full time. Learn, learn from them. I mean, that's, that's how, why I moved up. I, most people know I used to live in Gainesville, Florida. And I moved up from Gainesville, Florida at the age of 24 to be around people you know, who, um, who were involved in the markets frequently. And I, I want to immerse myself in that world so that I could learn as much as possible. So that's just something you have to do. Yeah. Really good way to finish the live today. Anything you want to mention? Any other advice you would have for people or anything you want to answer right now? Oh, man. Um, I know you and I are going to have another session hopefully in Definitely. January. Um, so that's going yeah. to be really exciting. Uh, let's see. Ty says, do you scale in and out of your day trades? I scale out of them, but not in them. Um, if I get into a trade, I just get into it. I'm in like high, high 95% of the time. Like I very rarely scale into a trade. Sometimes I do if the market's really choppy, like right now I'll scale into it. But if it's a, if it's a day trade, it's too much work usually to scale in. So I'm just, I'm in full, full risk. And then I will scale out for sure. Uh, but other than that, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, my, my main mission in life is to enrich lives with mentally liberating education. I appreciate you listening to this podcast. I appreciate you watching the video. Um, Etienne's done a great job with Desire to Trade, really building it up to a great brand, a great podcast, and really helping tons of people from around the world. So I just want to say thank you um, for letting me be on your show and right. for all that you do, man, helping so many people grow, learn, travel like you are, living the dream, and uh, being on top of the world. Definitely. And make sure you guys check out the link below for Jeremy's training room. And also, we'll put a, an announcement soon for our next session in January with Jeremy. He's going to come back, share a lot of cool things for the new year and things that can really make the big difference for next year, which I'm really thrilled about. And we'll catch you here pretty soon. Yes. All right, my man. Thank you. Yeah.